We're here at Sebring. I'm Dan Johnson. I'm talking to Robert Helms about UL Power. You can tell that because he's got the right shirt on. UL Power is an interesting company that, well, I never heard of more than about 10 years ago, and I think if I ask you for some history, I'll find out that number is about right. Let's give kind of an overview first, and then we want to go look at an airplane that's got one of your engines on it that was enabled, I believe is the word you used, because of the engine. So let's start out with the beginning. Well, Where did UL Power start with what engine and then walk me through the steps to today in this thing that we've got in front of us? Okay, the uh, company started in 2002 with a 97 horsepower engine and uh, they're, they're based in Belgium and they started in the European market and the company name UL is actually from Ultralight which is their light sport category. So they were focused on 97, 107 now, now horsepower. Let me back up here a little bit. Ultralight in Europe means something different than it does in the United States. Ultralight in Europe is a two-seat airplane much like our LSA, but not quite as much because they don't weigh as much. So you needed how much power at the beginning? We had, our very first engine was 97 horsepower. Okay. And then uh, the, the, the same basic engine we had. That was a four cylinder. That's four cylinder. As I can see over here, this is a six cylinder. So Correct. It's a four cylinder and uh, you get variations on that theme too. So it produces a lot of different power levels. How does that all work? Well, the, the same engine, the 97 horsepower, we simply change the compression. It goes up to 107 horsepower. And then another variant, we have the four cylinder engine also. It's 118 or 130 horsepower with a different compression. And those all work well in the light sport airplanes. Okay. And then continue on from there. You added uh, more cylinders and we more up, pressure? Yeah, we what? went up to a 3.9 liter engine, six cylinder, and we got 140 and 160 horsepower. And then we went even larger and we have a 5.2 liter engine that's 180 or 200 horsepower. And where does the six cylinders come in on that list? Of the 130 horsepower is the largest four cylinder. Okay. And then the 140 horsepower. So is four the cylinders, six cylinder. 130, 97 to 130, six cylinders, you go from 140 up to 200. 200. So 97 to 200 horsepower out of a series of engines based on the same essential design criteria. Correct. Where did the company have its background, Robert? Well, the guys that designed the engine, uh, they've been building race car engines for like Paris to Dakar, you know, the, the uh, off-road, the road rally type. Ah, okay. And so they started in the early 70s and they did a lot of experimenting and they traveled with the race teams and so they a heavy focus on maintenance. So their design is not just for the design of the engine, but they focus on maintenance and longevity because of the, the circumstances they were in. So, and the other thing that's really nice is UL Power is a combination of two different companies. One is that, that the team that made the race car engines, but also the metal company. So everything is their own design and manufacture. So they actually design, machine almost all of the components. Is that right? This is an in-house production here. You're not buying. They're not buying components from other places. Correct. So. They, the pistons are purchased. The uh, crankshaft is their own design, but somebody else manufactures it. But other than that, everything is their own design and manufacturing. It's all computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing. So they're able to do a, uh, a lot of real neat things with the real light weight. So the, the thrust to weight ratio on, our, on these engines is awesome. And uh, uh, talking a little bit about the engines, there's some technology on these engines as well. Now, you know, in the last couple of years, we've been hearing a lot more about fuel injection, which is not new in the world of automobiles, but it's fairly new in the world of air aviation engines. How does UL Power match up with some of that use of new technology? With the, what's awesome is it's direct drive air cooled, which is traditional design, and then the modern technology, it's got multi-point fuel injection, and then it's got dual electronic ignition, and it's got FADEX. So the computer, the ECU, which is a main component of the FADEX system, it has sensors on the engine, so it's sensing and sending the data to the ECU, various temperatures and pressures, based on those in, that information. It then knows what to do with the spark and with the mixture. It knows when to give it the, when to give it the fuel and how much fuel and what to do with the timing. So in the cockpit, you just have a throttle and the engine, the ECU is constantly controlling the spark and the mixture. So you're not doing anything with the mixture control separately then? There's no primer, no choke, no carburetor heat, no mixture. And FADEC is something we heard about in the certified world first, uh, but it's obviously not limited to that. FADEC uh, full authority digital engine control, I think, That's if it. I got my uh, little abbreviation down there. And you've had that on these engines for a while? From day one. Is that right? So yeah. right from the beginning you were using that technology. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the Cirrus company that sold a lot of uh, handsome airplanes calls it a single lever control. Mm -hmm. Just, you want to go, just push the throttle. And theirs even controls the prop and some other stuff. And, uh, uh, but that kind of a computer 
aid in engine control, I guess you could call it, uh, really makes for a better product, does it? What's nice is I've heard two really nice quotes. Um, uh, one of the pilots at Zenith Aircraft, he said, uh, you know, what's somebody asked him, what do you have to do to learn how to fly this engine? He said, nothing, it's just the throttle. And then another nice thing was one of the uh, FAA uh, personnel, he said, you know, this engine is going to make the pilot workload and the pattern so much less. You don't have to worry about carburetor heat, you don't have to worry about the mixture. It'll just enable the pilot to you know, look outside the cockpit, watch the runway, look for traffic, it'll be a much safer engine. Do what he needs to do with the throttle, yeah. I'll worry about the details. Yeah. The computer is going to take care of that. Yeah. Now we're used to it today. I just read that in automobiles, a typical new automobile has 400 sensors on it, uh, dealing with all kinds of things in the car. So we're already used to this stuff. And what we're used to is that we don't have to do anything. Yeah. Now this is true in aviation engines. Another good example is startup and in, uh, in, uh, operation in cold weather and then also in warm weather. It, you know, a lot of guys coming down here with other engines, you know, from up north they had to travel, you know, they brought space heaters so they could warm their engines before they start them. And with ours you don't have to do that. It knows the engine temperature, it knows the ambient air pressure, it knows the, the, uh, the air temperature, so the ECU compensates for all that. And the same way if it's hot, if you've ever tried to start a fuel injected engine at high density altitude on a hot day, it's nearly impossible yeah, luck, with this. Right, you just yeah. turn the key and it starts. <laughs> it handles it for you. Alright, well let's go have a look at an airplane that has got one of your engines in it. Awesome. So, Robert, I'm looking here now. I can see it's a six-cylinder engine. It's an airplane that I know and have loved to fly, the Rands S7 Courier. What's the combination here and why is this special? This is the 3.9 liter six-cylinder. It's 160 horsepower. What's nice about the 3.9 liter is it's got the narrower stroke. So with the firewall on the S7 being as small as it is, we're able to put a six-cylinder engine on here. You're talking this way, the total width of the engine. Correct fits this particular airplane better. Correct. Is that the enabling that you talked about then? The, that's part of it. The real thing is the weight. Uh, what's nice about this engine, the, it's 220 pounds and you get 160 horsepower. And there really isn't another engine in that category. So if it weren't for this engine, we really couldn't have 160 horsepower in a Rans S7. Now we've got the owner here. Why don't you introduce him for us and let's, uh, let's talk a little Brian. bit about it. Come on in here nice and close. All right. This is Brian. Just right in. All right. There you go. Uh, uh, Brian uh, actually bought the engine from the, or the plane from the guy that built it, but he's got two of them. He's actually got an S7 with our 130 horsepower engine. Okay, so a good comparison then. Yeah, and he's flown the S7 with the Rotax, so he can speak okay, to the, great. the performance well, of the three. Well, do that, please. Uh, we love the Rotax engine. That's how I flew this airplane. Right. It works great. But uh, now you've flown that and two variations of the UL Power engine. Correct. Do a little bit of summary about how those uh, compared for us, Brian. Okay, the uh, Rotec engine is uh, is an uh, excellent engine for the for the Rans airframe. Uh, however, it, uh, it lacks a little bit of uh, spunk that the UL provides. The 130 horsepower on the yeah, you got 100 horsepower on the right, Rotec. So right, the Rotec. 130 100, is a pretty good bump, and it's a really good combination engine airframe to 130 on the on the Rans S. So then, why go to 160? Because this is an experimental airplane, we're seeing and you can, huh? <laughs> we can. We just can. So you had 100, 100 horsepower on the original, then you went to 130, and now you're going to 160. Tell me a little bit about the different mission that that implies. Why go to 160 if 130 was good? Uh, because we were experimenting with the 160. Uh, uh, my colleague Sam uh, Kite was putting 160 horsepower. I knew the I knew what the, what the 130 would do. We were real curious to see what the 160 would do in the Rams S7. And it's experimental, so you can, you can pull one out, do another thing. Exactly. And Robert, the same value of the width is, was was applicable here. Well, the actually, that, we actually, the 130 horsepower engine is actually almost four inches wider than this because it's this, it's four cylinders, but it's got okay. a larger stroke, so it's wider. So and this one that here one, is the 140. Uh, 130, 160. I mean. 160. 160. <laughs> Lost in some of these numbers here. And we had to widen the cowling a little bit. And you bit. did have to widen the cowling. Right. Well, it doesn't look like you had to widen it too much. No, on the, one, on the 130 we widened the cowling. Ah, I see. Okay, and then this one you're just following suit. That's right. Okay. Okay, and now the mission, the, the differences that you wanted to do, you're talking about uh, the, the airplane that had the big gear on it and so forth. Right. It's, it's a really, really a utility aircraft for yeah. flying a where we live in Tennessee, there's a lot of a lot of fields to land in. All of our friends have airports that are very unimproved, and we just go around there and, and enjoy our enjoy our flying. And uh, and this is a little uh, 
uh, too nice an airplane for some of the stuff we put it through up there. Uh, the engines of uh, the standard engine pulled back at cruise just lumbers along very, very smoothly, very nicely. Uh, keeps up with uh, the uh, we typically fly to, fly the airplanes together, so. I'll burn the same fuel in this as I would uh, in, a, in a Rotec 912. Oh, is that right? Yeah, okay. even though it, I'm not utilizing all the horsepower typically cruising it. So, yeah. Robert, let me ask you a little bit about fuel burn rates. What are the differences in the fuel burns on some of the engines there, just to put it in perspective for us? A Rotex, for example, kind of our standard is, you know, between four and five gallons an hour, depending on how you're operating or which specific engine it is. How do you compare? Well, he actually hit it right on. It really depends on the on any one airframe with the drag, uh, it, it really depends on the speed. So you can take the same plane, you can take a Zenith 50 with the Rotax or the UL Power flying at the same speed, you're burning about the same fuel. But okay. with the UL Power, his 130 horsepower for instance, he can add more power and walk away from the Rotax powered S7 and he can cruise at VNE because he's got enough power. At that point, he's probably burning six and a half gallons an hour. Okay. Right. If he's cruising with the Rotax, then yeah, that's with which half. engine? Which horsepower? That's with the 130 engine? horsepower. With the 130, okay, six and a half gallons an hour. Plus, that we've added a lot at, at maximum also. Right. And we've added a lot because that plane's so utility, it's got the tundra tires, and we had a lot of drag to it. Yeah, so, sure. So it makes a difference. Yeah. Well, yeah, speed versus uh, fuel burn rate, but just fuel, pure fuel burn rate uh, between four and six and a half gallons an hour, depending on just how far in the throttle yeah. is. Yeah. And as you get into the bigger engine jet, how does that burn rate? With the biggest engine you've got, the 200 horsepower, what's the burn rate on that? We're uh, just now working on an RV4, so we'll get some good numbers from that, but we're estimating at a high crew setting, take off in a high crew setting, probably nine to 10 gallons an hour. Okay. And uh, more realistic, 65, 75%, probably about seven and a half gallons an hour. Okay, so those are pretty economical numbers for a considerable amount of power on it. Yeah. All right, great. Okay, so, you're getting all this utility out of these engines, they'll perform well, their burn rates are good on them. Talk to me about maintenance. Talk to me about time between overhaul. Well, what's good about maintenance is we don't require that you go to a service center, and Brian's a good example of this. You know, if he's got a, an issue, he's troubleshooting, he can call me and say, you know, I'm working on such and such. And we've got our online, we've got our maintenance manual, illustrated parts catalog, and, and Wix Aircraft is going to carry our parts now, so you'll be, you know, uh, parts they're going to be your fulfillment then. They're yeah. sending out a parts for it. Yeah, okay. and so if somebody's able to build an airplane, they could probably maintain the engine. If they don't want to, they get a local AMP to help them, or even an auto mechanic. And then we also have various places, about, probably about five places around the country, we've got individuals that are either AMP or builder assist that have been helping with customers with either installation or People service. People have issues. some knowledge about you all Correct. power in particular. Correct. Okay. And then uh, just now, within the last month, we signed up a service center in Georgia and we're negotiating now with the service center in Paso Robles, California, and they will also evolve and become overhaul centers as well. Okay. So, time between overhaul, what was the number? The TBO is currently 1,500 hours, the and we're actually working on... on all engines, correct, by the way? Correct. Okay. And we're actually working on uh, a new methodology, along with, you know, the new design, new technology, or new methodology. We want to do, we want to help people maintain their engines. So we're setting up a database so people can get online and input their compressions, input their CHTs, and they can compare their plane at the previous annual and also their plane to the fleet. And we're working with the oil analysis company, same way, you can see your oil, but you can also see the entire fleet. And then what we want to do is if we see any trends, we'll contact owners and say, hey, you might want to at 300 hours do such and such because everybody else is having to do it. So kind of anticipate things. Okay. And then ho hopefully with that, the need for the overhaul may kind of go away. You know, if we can deal with a lot of these things, because there's an awful lot of maintenance you can do to these engines without splitting the case. And so, so, so kind of an ongoing maintenance yeah, program. Yeah, like an on condition or a condition monitoring, kind of like the airlines do and working with the, the manufacturers like Boeing and Airbus, you know, more of a sampling and trend analysis and, and things like that. And then we're hoping that with the technology of the engines, we will be able to revolutionize for the home builder the, the maintenance process and kind of smooth out the cost and keep the cost down. Cool. Well, a lot of great information here. Thank you, Brian, for all your input. Robert, you've given us a lot to think about here. and. Yet people always want more. Where can we send them on the web for the people to get more information about UL Power? Well, we've got the website, ulpower.com, and there's a lot of information on there. And in there, there's some other links to other things. We have current projects like this on Facebook, and we've got a wiki set up, but all that's available through ulpower.com. ulpower.com, you can find it all. Lots more about all kinds of affordable aircraft and affordable aviation on bydanjohnson.com. Thanks for joining, joining Robert, Brian, and myself here at Sebring.